is it just incompetence and negligence or is there something more sinister going on here? Um, you know, Ted Cruz uh, is sort of making the point that you raised earlier in this yep. clip we're about to roll. He believes that there is uh, there are overtly political decisions that have led to under coverage of Trump. Um, let's roll yeah. Ted Cruz's clip, and I'd like to get your thoughts on the argument okay. that he's laying out here. I believe that the Secret Service leadership made a political decision to deny these requests. And I think the Biden administration has been suffused with partisan politics. Did the same person who denied the request for additional security to President Trump also repeatedly deny the request for security to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., whose father was murdered by an assassin and whose uncle was murdered by an assassin. Did the same person make that decision? Senator, what I will tell you is that Secret Service agents are not political. Okay, you're not answering my question. But, but you know what? Leadership to your appointed answer, by the Senator, president, leadership appointed to. by the president is political. I have a simple question, yes or no. Did the same person deny the Trump request that also denied the RFK request? That's a yes or no question. Uh, Senator, that is not a yes or no question. One, there is a process for a candidate nominee to receive protection. Is there, that does the is buck a stop bicameral, anywhere? Does that is the a buck bicameral, stop bipartisan anywhere? process so, that the Hill It's a bicameral, bipartisan process. What camera? For a candidate, you, for you are a not candidate a Congress. You don't have a camera. Mr. Kennedy submitted a request that was referred over to the CPAC. Okay, you're refusing to answer the question. Let me ask, because the failures on that day were catastrophic. By the way, is it true that on the day of the of the Butler event that Secret Service transferred agent from President Trump to the First Lady? Uh, no, sir, that's not true. That's been widely reported. Uh, it's not true. There was one airport agent that actually went on the manpower request for the Trump detail. They handled the arrival at the airport. What for is the, first the lady What was the relative the size of the Trump detail compared to the detail that is assigned to the President of the First Lady? Uh, Senator, the former president travels with a full shift, just what, like what, the president. What's the, re so the exact same size? Is that your testimony that, that the, President Trump had the same size detail that President Biden has? On the day of in Butler, the agents surrounding him, it is the same number of agents surrounding the president today. There is a difference between a sitting president who also not only- Hold has, on, you're using president in a way that is not clear. Is it your testimony that in Butler, Pennsylvania, Donald Trump had the same number of agents protecting him that Joe Biden has at a comparable event. I'm telling you the shift, the close protection shift surrounding. That's, that's yes what you no. asked me, Senator, and I'm trying to answer it. You, you are not answering it. Is it the same number of agents or not? Senator, there is a difference between the sitting president of the United States. Then what's the difference? The difference? 2X, 3X, 5X, National 10X? Command Authority to launch a nuclear strike, I, sir. I'm, there I'm are other asked assets how many that more travel agents? with the president that sir, the former president sir, will not get. you are refusing get. to but answer But the number straight. of Secret Service sir, agents stop protecting him. Stop, stop interrupting me. Go ahead, you Senator. You are refusing to answer clear and direct questions. I am asking the relative difference in the number of agents between those assigned to Donald Trump and those assigned to Joe Biden. I'm not asking why you assign more to Joe Biden. I'm asking, is the difference, is it 2X? Is it 3X? Is it 5X? Is it 10X? Senator, I will get you that number so you can see it with your own eyes. Okay. Um, so, sure. uh, again, it's a little bit astounding that he can't ballpark what the difference is and just answer Cruz's question. Um, but what, what do you make of his response? You know, he is answering there that there's a difference between a sitting president and a former president who's running the right. president, which, again, is an unusual situation. It's not something we've seen in our lifetime where you've got a one term president who then, you know, loses and then is running again. So it is a unique situation. But what is there legitimacy to that idea that Actually, yeah, there should be different coverage for Biden versus Trump. Well, Zach, I think you hit it right on the head, right? This is a unique and an unusual situation, right? Because yeah. prior to Trump, when you talked about a former president, the level of protection and the level of manpower and assets afforded to the sitting president of the United States and the former president uh, really was like night and day, right? Um, when, when, um, Ted Cruz is asking about multiples in terms of manpower. 
it, there isn't even a comparison. It, it really is. It goes from hundreds of people for the sitting president of the United States and, and you, you know, multiple aircraft and helicopters and 50, 60 car motorcades to, you know, five guys in a, uh, in a rented suburban, right? And when you talk about a former president, what comes to mind is, you know, 99 year old Jimmy Carter who shows up, you know, maybe on Christmas and he's going to uh, go, uh, you know, do something at a Habitat for Humanity event. Or, yeah. you know, former President Bush, you know, maybe we see him once a year. He shows up on TV and he wishes people, you know, Merry Christmas, that type of thing. Uh, President Trump, if anything, I, and I don't think this is a, a reach when I say this, this guy's um, profile and his world standing has done nothing but exponentially increase since he's left office, right? This guy's traveling all over the world. He travels in a big aircraft that says Trump on the side. You know, for the Secret Service to have treated him simply as a former president, huge mistake there. The Secret Service loves to hide behind this phrase, there's no adverse actionable intelligence. And they use that, the the threat level, the amount of, of intelligence that they're gathering um, to figure out what kind of manpower and assets they'll afford or protect the other service. Normally that would work, but to sit there and think, and you tell me if I'm wrong as a non-Secret Service you know, person, to sit there and think that some group, organized group, is going to telegraph their intentions to shoot President Trump or cause the Trump family some harm to interfere or impact the potential outcome of this election, you're just totally wrong, right? So to act on, well, since we didn't, we don't know about anything, no one's, nothing's come to light, that's going to allow us to dictate the manpower and assets we give to Trump. I don't know what you're thinking. You are not a trained Secret Service agent if you're taking that approach. And keep something else in mind. Ted Cruz mentioned RFK. And again, the Secret Service acting director says, well, we didn't give him protection because he didn't meet certain requirements and there was no adverse actionable intelligence. Hey, the guy's last name is Kennedy. Is there sure. anyone in the world who would be surprised if the Secret Service declined to provide protection to this guy, particularly as he declares himself a presidential candidate, you know, I have to ask, what are you thinking by not providing a guy named Kennedy? In this guy case, his father was killed um, and his uncle, right, which has led to conspiracy theories that will be spoken about till the end of time. Seventy years later, we're still debating, you know, what went on there. Um, yet the yeah. Secret Service doesn't provide protection to him. I think that just gives insight into into the the thinking process or lack of thinking process of the Secret Service leadership. Total nonsense. Not to mention, look at this guy, Roe. Do does he appear to have the composure that's necessary to deal not just with Congress, to answer the most basic questions? The guy's argumentative and combative. He represents 7,000 employees at the Secret Service, yet you're arguing with the guys who ultimately will approve your budget. And if you're right. asking for more money, that is a terrible stance to take with these folks, uh, certainly when you're on TV, getting into an argument with the, with these guys, considering you're going to be asking for more money and more assets. Um, this guy should not be the acting director. That raises the next issue I wanted to get to, which is staffing, because yep. that's partly what we've heard from the Secret Service is that they're just stretched too thin. There was an interesting moment in this hearing that we're playing clips from, which, by the way, is from July 30th, so a couple Did weeks it? after the Butler shooting, um, where Dick Durbin is pressing Roe about the budget because he's saying, look, we've doubled the budget over 10 yeah. years and it's like, why are you struggling right now? Let's roll that clip and I'd like you to talk a little bit about your perspective on the staffing sure. of the Secret Service. Congress has nearly dub doubled the budget for the Secret Service over the last 10 years from 1.8 billion in fiscal year 2014 to 3 billion in fiscal year 2024. Despite this large increase in funding, the number of agents in protect protective operations has fallen from 4,027 to 3,671 during that same time period, an approximate 9% reduction. Acting Director Rowe, what accounts for protective operations losing 356 agents over the past 10 years? So, Senator, uh, 
with respect to where we are today on staffing, and then I'll address the the ten year uh, where we were. In this year alone, we are going to end the year uh, on the positive of 200 plus agents. That's the first time in a number of years that we've been able to do that. Part of that was gaining some efficiencies uh, in our hiring process. Director I think there was a variety of factors. Some of it was the pandemic. Some of it was um, you know, the economy or other opportunities. We have people that are very skilled in cyber that often leave the job. Some of the protective skills that they acquire are also in demand in the private sector. But some of the mechanisms that we've put in place just in the last year is also retaining our workforce. And that's what we are focused on right now. Did you feel like the Secret Service was underfunded during your time there? Does the story that Roe is laying out there about the pandemic uh, add up with what you've seen? No, as a matter of fact, I think it's just the opposite, right? The pandemic and the poor economics uh, that the U.S. is going through would only increase the number of applicants, right? The Secret Service sure. has never had an applicant problem. It's never had a uh, a recruitment problem, right? It The problem now is you've got a, a former director who, by her own admission, said she's on a quest, a DEI quest, to, uh, to get as many women and minorities uh, hired as quickly as possible, uh, which led to uh, poor recruiting practices and the washing out of people who were perfectly qualified applicants but as she's pursuing, you know, we're not going to hire these people because we're specifically targeting women. Um, that's a problem, right? Um, not to mention, look, Ron Rowe and the senior leadership of the Secret Service, some of whom were seated behind them at that congressional uh, testimony, they've been in position for four years, right? Since since Biden became president. Yet it never occurred to you folks that through attrition, the Secret Service is losing more and more guys. Um, that 200 number he speaks about being up 200, he doesn't mean 200 overall. He's talking yeah. about just in that last fiscal year, they've hired 200 people. The problem is they are so below where they should to be, should be, that that should have been addressed years ago, right? This is not the New York City Police Department where when they hire a police class, you're getting 3,000 people at a time. When the Secret Service hires a class, they hire 24 people at a time. So if you can get 20 people through the class, you know, people drop out due to maybe they get injured or they they can't shoot, they can't qualify, that type of thing. So on average, you're losing two or four people. So we'll call it 20 people at, at a time. Well, it takes a year for the investigative process to get done to the point where they can hire someone. And then another six months as they go through the various, you know, training courses before they get assigned to a field office. Um, yet apparently this has never been addressed by any of the leadership at the Secret Service. The budget question comes up all the time. The budget right now sits about three and a half billion dollars. Listen, there are plenty of companies in the United States, if not the world, that would be incredibly successful if I gave them a three and a half billion dollar budget. The problem is, is in how the money is allocated um, and frankly spent. The Secret Service has a tendency to continue to um, um, promote people from within the ranks. And ultimately what happens is, and you see this when you look at the business side of the House of the Secret Service, the chief operating officer has no real business acumen, no financial world experience. It's an agent that got promoted and now holds the title of chief operating officer. The same thing with chief executive officer, head of communications, CFO, so on and so forth. These people uh -huh. are nowhere near qualified to manage a budget of three and a half billion dollars. That is a huge number. And keep in mind, the people managing that Budget, these are government employees who are making $180,000 a year. What appreciation do they have and knowledge do they bring to the table that uh, would afford them the opportunity to manage that kind of budget? There's no company in the world that would allow somebody in that position to manage that kind of budget. So again, it's a poor promotion practice that led to that money just being thrown away. And I, I mentioned earlier about the overtime. There are very few federal agencies that afford, um, at least from a law enforcement perspective, agents the opportunity to make overtime. Even with the fact the Secret Service can pay overtime in certain situations, like protective situations, there's a salary cap. So I would yeah. argue that if anybody knew what they were doing from a CFO perspective, you know what the, what the worst case scenario is in terms of having to pay people. Yet you don't yeah. project out for that and budget for that. That's a problem in itself. And I'll, I'll leave you with, with some of these numbers. When I was in the New York field office, they had 227 agents. As of about a month ago, they were down to 81. That is a huge problem. That is the largest, that is known as the flagship office in the Secret Service. 
how did no one address this over the mm. course of the last, you know, at least four years? What are these guys doing? This is why I say the Secret Service is broken in many respects. So this sounds like in some ways sort of the classic story of a government agency that just becomes bloated and perpetuates yep. its own administrative class at the expense of pursuing its mission to the greatest and most excellent degree possible. Um, and yep. it kind of, you know, mission drift is another thing that happens to government agencies a lot where we're fulfilling some other priority instead of our main purpose, which is to protect these high high value political actors. Um, and I wonder if that explain can partially explain this the idea that it was too hot to get up on the roof because is it like this is their way of retaining a uh, workforce is we're gonna accommodate your discomfort uh, and you know not make you get up on a hot roof and that was why that sort of bureaucratic kind of nonsensical management decision is that one possible explanation as to why no one was up there yeah, as simple as that sounds, I've been asked that question many times. And my answer is, yeah. If you don't think okay. that fact that it was a hot Saturday afternoon and you had to put someone on a metal roof um, affected the decision to actually tell a fellow agent, hey, that's your post on that roof, or even led to a guy being posted or a woman being posted on that roof and they just simply said, I'm not staying up here. It's too hot. Um, yeah, hey. I Bet you if we did a little more digging, that's exactly how this played out. Now, I've done some pretty big sites in some crazy adverse conditions. Uh, during the Republican National Convention, I was a site agent in Penn Station, which was open to the 300,000 commuters and the five rail lines throughout the entire duration of that week of the convention. Listen, there's some pretty hot spots down in some of those tunnels. Guys, they don't want to be down there, but you got to figure out how to make this work. And if that yeah. means... Instead of using one guy to hold the post, I use two and they push each other off every half hour so a guy can go sit in the air conditioning. You make the accommodation. So even if we would have needed to put two people on that roof, give a guy a an umbrella, a cooler with water, whatever, the, the weather cannot be a factor in 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 your um, explanation for not putting a guy on that roof. You know, we, this isn't the Teamsters Union, right? Whereas you're a Secret Service agent. We've got people, and, and this isn't just for the protection of President Trump, whether you like Trump or not, you had 15 or 20,000 American citizens at that event with their families trying to see something that they may never get to see again. And you don't have the, the foresight to say, hey, we need to post somebody up there because if somebody gets up there and opens fire, he may not hit Trump, but he's going to hit people up. And that's exactly what happened. Look at the the, the decision that was made with the Trump detail, right? After those shots were fired, the, the six agents assigned to the Trump detail, we commonly referred to as, as the body guys, right? The media refers to them as the body guys. They all show up on stage, and instead of just piling on Trump and rushing him off the stage, you know, they sit there for a little over two minutes, which is a whole other story. You know, why that was done is, is beyond any reasonable Secret Service agent. But once they leave the stage, look at the shift deployment around the, the motorcade, right? Six yes, Secret Service agents assigned to the Trump detail, three of whom turn out to be women, right? That is not done coincidentally. If you took all the names of the Secret Service agents in the Secret Service and put them in a hat, I would bet that you would go 100, 200 names deep before you could pull out a female's name. Yet you're hmm. telling me it's just coincidence that half the detail happened to be women. That decision was made from a pure optics standpoint by former director Cheadle. That all seems to me like it falls under the umbrella of what we were talking about of either bureaucratic bloat or concern yeah. with the optics or quotas or what have you. But I'm wondering about the more I don't know, sinister explanation that mm -hmm. someone in the government wanted this to happen or kind of set things in motion yeah. so that this was more likely to happen um, and, and, and not really caring. Um, like, do you think someone in the government, whether it's Secret Service, DHS, someone in the, at the decision making level at some level wanted this to happen? I don't know if we'd say wanted it to happen, but certainly should have seen it coming. Right. 
Now, I don't know if a discussion ever took place amongst the direct, the leadership of the Secret Service, the leadership of DHS, unnamed sources, you know, people at the White House and the Attorney General's office that they said, hey, you know, um, let, let's see what we can do to put this guy in a position where something can happen. But I do think, and, and I, I think if I, you gave me some time, I bet you I could probably give more credence to this. There had to be conversations that, that occurred um, within the Secret Service leadership, right? They've got 10 assistant directors that run various positions. You've got another 10 deputy assistant directors. This is the senior leadership of the Secret Service, the deputy director and the director. I know they have meetings every Monday, full staff meetings. You're telling me none of these leaders ever raised his hand and said, you know, if we keep cutting back all these assets and continue to treat Trump as just another former president or as a simple candidate, we're inviting something to happen. You're telling me no one said that? I I'm not buying but that at all. I think what happened there is you've got a deputy director and you've seen this act, Ron Rowe. The guy's combative. He cuts a big path. He's loud. I think he just said, you know what, we're going to do this my way. And he took his marching orders from the Secretary of Homeland Security and from the White House. And they said, cut back all the assets you possibly can. And they knew, although it was probably never discussed, you're opening the door to something happen. Right now, the Secret Service has 30, at least 30 other protective details uh, that are being covered within the Biden administration. That includes people like the White House press spokesman the deputy press spokesperson, the national security advisor, their deputies. Most of these people would walk out of the back door of the White House. Nobody would know who these people are. Yet President Biden, by executive order, authorized the Secret Service to provide details to these people. Why? They put them in a car, right? There's plenty of government cars with drivers that are at the White House. Drive them to where they got to go, and that's the end of it. Get them a, an armed Capitol police officer or a D.C. Metro. Why are you using Secret Service resources for these people? And that includes Hunter Biden, right? So Hunter Biden, the guy who's 60 years old, hasn't paid taxes in five years, made, what, $35 million through Burisma, is afforded Secret Service protection at taxpayer expense? Hey, these people can afford their own protection. Why, if, if you're so um, short of resources for the guy who may become the next president of the United States, and if he gets killed, this is going to have worldwide implications for the entire United States. You're so short of resources. Why are we protecting all these other people? The same thing with, and you claim you're short of resources. Hey, walk down to the United Nations in New York City this week and look at all those details that are out there. Where did the Secret Service get all those people and resources from? So to tell me you don't have the manpower and resources, I'm not buying that at all. And, and you mentioned a few minutes ago about the government bloat. Look at yeah. the last press conference that Ron Rowe was forced to do. And what does he say? We need more money and we're going to stand up. He mentioned at least three other um, divisions that the Secret Service is going to stand up to ensure that this never happens again. Not nah, all nonsense. There is no need for any of that. Get back to the basics. Do what you do best. And you've been doing for 150 years. And these problems go away. They're not yeah. being addressed. That's the issue. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we're going to need to see the internal communications to be able to determine that question of, you know, yep. whether someone was raising these risks and whether that was ignored, you know, after what was revealed in the wake of uh, COVID about some of the conversations yep. going on between Fauci and his inner circle, yep. I would not be surprised to see some uh, pretty bad decisions come to light. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Just Asking Questions. You can watch another one here or the full episode there. We have an audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to using the link in the description and subscribe to Reason TV for notifications when these episodes go up every Thursday. Hope to see you then.